Fizz Fun Interactive Sunday School. And I'm sorry if you're not able to go in person to church, but I know that there's a need for this kind of a video. Uh, we live in very perilous times, and everyone has to do as their conscience directs them. The one thing that I miss the most is the fellowship of my fellow believers uh, in Sunday school and in the church and being able to corporately worship together and have everybody else's voices out drown mine as we're singing the hymns and the choruses because I certainly enjoy singing even though I can't sing. Uh, so maybe if you're at home watching this, you can sing a little bit and not in interfere with anybody else's worship. Uh, I certainly have found that helpful as I watch the services, both from Five Forks and First Baptist Landrum, uh, to be able to sing along with the music uh, on the recorded services. Well, we're in the book of Isaiah. It's an exciting time. It's 740 to 680 BC before Christ. It's before the beginning of the exile when Daniel was taken out of uh, Judah and uh, Israel. And uh, we uh, see that Isaiah is going to prophesy about that time, uh, even though it has not yet come. As a matter of fact, it's almost 100 years away. And uh, yet Isaiah has been given a vision by God. And unlike Ezekiel, where he hears from the Lord, uh, most of Isaiah's words come from a vision or visions that God gives him. And it certainly is an interesting time. Uh, in scripture because uh, many people have said that Isaiah is a book that is uh, more f uh, fulfilling of prophecies about the Messiah than any other Old Testament book. And so it becomes very exciting to see that uh, God gives visions to Isaiah that would see the coming Messiah, would see the Messiah on his throne ruling and reigning for all eternity. So it's an incredible book. Now let's kind of review a little bit. Uh, we, we want to be sure that you understand that Isaiah is one of four prophets uh, who wrote uh, in the time that was pre-exile. That is, these four prophets wrote before the exile of Daniel and then later uh, the 10 to 50,000 people that were exiled out of the divided kingdom of Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And you need to know that uh, there are contemporary writers at the time. Hosea and Micah are also writing at this time. So to really do a good study on Isaiah, you need to be going back and forth between Isaiah and Hosea and Micah. And you need to be looking at Second Kings and Second Chronicles uh, for the four kings uh, that Isaiah lived through, uh, at least part of their reigns. Uh, are the kings that are described in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles uh, and gives you a little better idea of what's actually going on in those countries at the time. Uh, certainly very, very helpful. I'd also say to you that uh, we call them major prophets because of the volume of material that they wrote. Isaiah happens to be the third of the four prophets in, in volume. He wrote 37,407 words. Uh, that are recorded here for in Scripture. And uh, it's got the largest number of chapters. And uh, the chapter breakout is quite interesting because we have 66 books to the Bible, and Isaiah has 66 chapters. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, we have 39 chapters that deal with giving of the law, the judgment, and God's covenant about keeping the law. Uh, and that coincides with the Old Testament's message of God giving the law in the Old Testament. Uh, and then we have 27 chapters in the book of Isaiah, which talk about the Messiah, the coming Messiah, and uh, the hope that we have in him. And, of course, the New Testament has 27 books, and they represent the coming Messiah and uh, his teachings here on earth and the start of the church. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, uh, the coming kingdom uh, with Jesus as uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we see a mini Bible in the book of Isaiah, 39 chapters with judgment and law and 27 chapters with hope in the Messiah. 
uh, representing the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, coincidental? I don't know, but it's interesting, isn't it, uh, that it be broken out that way. So as we look at this book, I hope that you're going to enjoy the study. Uh, our lesson writer is limited in the number of chapters that he can write about because of the uh, lesson plans that uh, Lifeway gives him. And so we're going to try to cover, at least in a very cursory way, the chapters in between his lessons so that you have some kind of an idea of the flow. My desire is that you would read the entire book of Isaiah, not at one sitting. Uh, I find that that's not a terribly effective way to study scripture, but rather just one section at a time to stop, meditate on it, look at perhaps the other supporting scriptures, the other writers of the time, the circumstances going on in uh, Israel at the time. So you'll need to go to Second Chronicles and Second Kings to get that, and that you'd really meditate on the messages, uh, because many times as we've looked at a special rose chart, of how prophets saw. Prophets saw uh, those things that were coming in a short amount of time, uh, such as the exile uh, and uh, the captivity of the people of Israel, uh, which would be just a hundred years after Isaiah, all the way out to times that are yet to come. Uh, and the fact that uh, the many of the prophecies, they were allowed to glimpse at a mountaintop. And I'm going to show you that chart right now so that you can get a better picture of how prophets often saw only the mountaintops. They didn't see the valleys. They didn't see the details. They didn't probably understand what they were writing. But aren't you glad that they did? Aren't you glad that God inspired them so that we could see the prophecies and fulfillments and get some real credibility to the fact that God actually is the author. Uh, he is the one who inspired the words to be written. And these prophecies were fulfilled exactly as he said they would be. Uh, if you're following along with my weekly thought for the day, five to seven minute thought for the day, you'll see that I'm going through the book of Ezekiel, uh, just a little after Isaiah. And uh, it's just incredible, uh, especially the city of Tyre and the history uh, that God predicted that the city would be scraped off the land and into the sea. And if you study that with me, you'll find out that that exactly happened and that there's historical evidence of that happening uh, in the land of Israel even today. So we know that the prophecies are being fulfilled in an incredibly way and give us great validity to uh, our belief and the Bible as being a, an accurate historical book. So let's take a look at that chart in just a few seconds. You can stop and start this video at any time if you want to study it a little more detail, anything that I put up there. So feel free to stop and start the video. But to take a look at this chart. I'm not going to leave it up too long because you can stop it and we don't want to tie up the, uh, the, the next viewer uh, by waiting too long with this chart. But let's take a look at the chart. My thanks to Rose Publishing, who put this chart together, and it really helps us to vi visualize how the prophets could only see mountaintops and uh, maybe seven events, uh, but most of them only saw one or two events, long and short. You'll remember that uh, the book of Isaiah has a very simple outline. We have the first section of Isaiah that has prophecies of judgment and the charges of why Israel is under judgment. We have the historical transition time when the actual invasion takes place or is prophesied. And then we see the prophetic uh, covenant of a Messiah coming. And uh, it's a very interesting outline that uh, gives us hope for the future and uh, understanding for the past. Uh, there's uh, a problem in Israel. It's a problem that uh, has long since plagued mankind. Israel is in a time of prosperity. Israel has either turned away from God or never accepted the reality of God or, or the fact that they have uh, become complacent uh, about God and taken him for granted uh, because of their prosperity. 
it's a thing called the sin cycle. And, and here's the way the sin cycle goes. You can see it through history. Everything that we have recorded in history talks about a sin cycle. My guess is you probably have had a sin cycle in your life. And, and what happens is we're in a time of prosperity and we're having time of blessings, time of good health and uh, financial security. And uh, we start to trust in our things instead of God. We start to get caught away from the church and from studying and reading the Bible and prayer. And we start to drift downward uh, until sin becomes more and more prevalent in our lives. Uh, and then we get to the bottom of the barrel in the muck and mire of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into because we've left God out, we've taken him for granted, and we've drifted away, and we cry out to God, Oh God, save us, help us out of this mess we're in. And God, in his infinite mercy and grace and kindness, reaches down into the muck and mire and grabs us by the hand and pulls us out. And for a little while, we're thankful and we're praising him. Uh, but our prosperity begins again. It gets greater and greater. And we start to slide again. We start to take him for granted. We start to slip away. We get careless in our church attendance. We get careless in our prayer and our Bible reading. And before you know it, we're back into a sinful condition, sliding down into the muck and mire. You can see it through the history of the nation of Israel. It's depicted for us in the scriptures. But you probably can see it in our nation, in America. How far have we come from our founding fathers? How far have we come from where we were, even in my lifetime? Uh, we've come a long way, haven't we? We have more and more people that are calling good evil and evil good. But we've drifted a long way away from God as a nation. And if we're not careful, we get caught up in that as well. So as we study the book of Isaiah, we see that Israel is in a time of prosperity. But in just a hundred years, they'd be in a time of calamity. They'd be down in the muck and mire and they'd be crying out once again to God. Uh, but it's a terrible sin cycle. And that's exactly where we are as we look at the book of Isaiah. We've already looked in chapter 1. And we've seen the sins of the nation of Israel. Remember, uh, the nation of Israel is now divided into two kingdoms, Israel to the north and Judah to the south, Jerusalem being down in Judah. And we see that the sin is prevalent in both areas. And as Isaiah is writing, he's, he's writing towards the tail end of what's happening in Israel and what's going to be happening in Judah. And so as we enter into this study, it would be good for us to just review quickly, not only chapter one where we had a full lesson, but the chapters that are between there and where we're gonna to begin today, which hopefully will give you a flow of the book of Isaiah. Taken from chapter one, our lesson writer has told us that God confronts, and he does, doesn't he? Uh, it's interesting to see how he uses his Holy Spirit to confront not only those that don't believe in God yet, those that are lost and headed towards hell, but he also confronts those that are saved, brings them into a recognition of their sin, their sinfulness, perhaps their carelessness. And he does confront. And he uses an example to help us to understand the nation of Israel. He reminds us that he had given everything to the nation of Israel. He had provided everything that they could possibly want. They gave him a perfect, beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He had given him a structure of worship. He had given him some guidelines for life. Now, I think it's really interesting that we need to approach those guidelines for life, the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, sometimes we think those are burdens that we carry on our back, that we have all of these do's and don'ts, and the Christian life is not easy trying to keep all of those laws. But in fact, if you really analyze the Ten Commandments and the purpose of the Ten Commandments, you'll recognize that it ties into John 10.10, 10, where Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. You see, when we do the things of the Ten Commandments that he tells us to do, we find joy and happiness and fulfillment. When we stay away from the things that he tells us not to do in the Ten Commandments, 
We don't have the sin, the shame, the guilt, and all of the problems that go along with having done the things that he says not to do. So what are the Ten Commandments for? They're for us. They're for us to have life and have it abundantly. Now, we can't fulfill those perfectly, and that's what he wanted to call our attention to in the Old Testament. He wanted us to realize that we're not perfect, that we have a sinful nature, and that we need more than the law. We need Jesus in our hearts to help us to live according to his ways. And so, as we look at the book of Isaiah in chapter 1, we see a reminder uh, that God has given us everything, just as he gave the nation of Israel everything. And yet the nation of Israel had become careless, they'd become backslidden, and, and they needed to be reminded. And they would not listen to the prophets. And so God had to bring about a judgment, but not without an explanation. He sent the judgments and the, the description of the judgments through his prophets so that the nation of Israel would be able to look and see why the punishment was coming. Wouldn't it be strange if you came home one day as a child and your father or your mother had their belt off and started to whip you without any explanation? Yes, it would. But they always gave you an explanation, didn't they? Whether it was a timeout or whether it was a good spanking, they gave you an explanation. They told you why you were being punished. And God does the same thing. He told the nation of Israel why they were being punished, what iniquities they had committed, what sins they had done. And one of the wonderful phrases that we're going to see as we go through this entire study that we could repeat our, it over and over and over again is found in chapter 1, verse 18. Come, let us reason together. So as we continue the study and we look at chapters 2 through 4 uh, so that we don't miss the overview of what's going on there, and as we enter into the actual lesson material today starting in chapter 5 and 6, that we would come and reason together. So let's take a look at what goes on in chapters 2 through 4. Now remember, we're in a time of prosperity, and as chapter 1 told us, they played the harlot. Uh, they've wandered away from God. They've refused to listen to his prophets. Uh, they've certainly been charged with a lot of iniquity. And uh, yet, as we look at chapters 2 through 4, we see that this is probably one message that was delivered and all of the chapter 2 through 4 deals with that one message. And that God says there will be a time of judgment, but there will also be a time of recovery and of a time of uh, peace and prosperity. Now, one of the phrases that I picked up on in chapter 2, and you may want to look at this in detail, was the fact that they would hammer their swords into plowshares and that it would be a peace it's interesting because that term and phrase is repeated again in Micah chapter 4, verse 3. And certainly when we talk about a time of peace, there was a small time of peace in the nation of Israel uh, after all of this that had gone on uh, with the captivity and the Babylonian and the Assyrian uh, invasions. Uh, but the kind of peace that we're talking about as you look at to Micah 4, 3, or as you look at this passage of Scripture, has to be looking all the way out to that mountaintop when there's truly going to be a lasting eternal peace. And the nation of Israel and all of the believers uh, will find a real peace uh, that we've never experienced before. In chapter 3, we see the judgments uh, that are coming. And uh, this, this is obviously a short-term prophecy and the nation of Israel would be invaded, uh, and there would be a siege of the city, which would cut off their food supply and their water supply, and he deals with that in chapter 3. Uh, but there's something extremely interesting in chapter 3 that you may want to go back and look at, uh, and that is in verse 10, when he says it's going to be well with the righteous. It's going to be okay. And in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, but woe to the wicked. What an interesting contrast that we find all through the scriptures. The righteous are going to be okay, but the wicked are going to find a woe. Uh, and that's a really interesting thing that all of us as Christians need to remember. That even if we should get sick, get the virus, have cancer, 
go through terrible health problems. If we truly have trusted in Jesus as our Savior, then we're just passing through this world and we have a better world waiting for us, a place called heaven where we'll be with Jesus and we'll be able to rule and reign with him for eternity. So we are always going to be okay. Doesn't mean that life here on earth is going to be easy. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine posted a passage of scripture on the internet yesterday on Facebook, and it was John 16, 33. In the world you'll have trouble or tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It's not the pie in the sky stuff that the preachers on TV often preach. And while you're in chapter 3, you may want to take note of the detail which is given to the prophet of the events that are yet to come. And that is the falling by the sword of the people that are in Jerusalem and Judea. And you'll also find that the gates would be flattened. And we know for a fact that uh, Jerusalem uh, was taken. Then the walls were knocked down. The gates were burned and uh, that they had to all be reestablished. So we see again the incredible accuracy of prophecy uh, in the Old Testament, which gives us the credibility of knowing that God is the one that authored the book. Now in chapter 4, we find again a very interesting statement, and that is after the siege of Jerusalem, which has yet to take place as Isaiah is prophesying about it, uh, chapter 4 opens up with the fact that there will be seven women for every man. Uh, I, I kind of laughed when I got to that section of scripture because it's not funny, uh, but it is only funny in the context which I'm going to share with you, and that is uh, that it's not funny for the fact that all those men that were fighting in Jerusalem were slain, and so women outnumbered men by that kind of a ratio. Uh, but it does remind me that after my father's wife had passed, uh, my dad had a time of uh, solemnness and uh, singleness for a year or two, and then he began to recognize that life was pretty lonely without a woman in your life, and he began to date, and at one particular time in his life, uh, he sat down with me, and he said, Pete, he said, uh, do you realize at my age, and I think at that time he was about 70 years of age, uh, he said, at my age, there are seven to ten women for every man. Uh, men's longevity is shorter than women's, and and there's seven to ten women for every man my age. And he said, I found six of mine so far. <laughs> and what, what he had was a little black book. And if he felt like going to a movie, he had a woman that liked movies. And if he liked to go and uh, eat at a fine restaurant, he had a woman that liked to eat out. And if he wanted to do something in the outdoors and nature, play tennis or, or do something of that nature, he had a woman that enjoyed that. And he said, Pete, I've got a woman for every occasion to share my life with me and to bring happiness into my life. And uh, he, he literally was looking for all seven to ten of his uh, to fulfill his life. So uh, you can see that uh, it probably was a man's world, uh, even though the great tragedy had come to Israel. Uh, there were seven women for every man. <laughs> Quite a humorous part of, of um, a sad situation. So we have uh, the uh, end of a message that Isaiah delivered probably full chapter 2 through 4, this one message, and we enter into chapter 5, which really is the beginning of today's lesson by the lesson writer. So if you're following along with the LifeWay publication, uh, this is probably where yours begins. And he gives us an analogy. The analogy is one of God planting a vineyard and providing everything that the vineyard needed. Now, I have a small garden here in North Carolina, and uh, it's a very small garden. This year, it's two tomato plants. Uh, the rest of it's been taken over by Lois's flowers. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it, there were also some fruit trees in that garden, and I try to provide everything that that garden needs. I try to, uh, with a sprinkler system, uh, try to keep it watered, I try to buy the right kind of fertilizer for the things that are planted, for the trees that are planted and the tomato plants that are planted. And that's exactly what God says here in chapter 5. He says, I, I started a vineyard and I gave it everything that it needed, the best of everything. And uh, 
He said, I made sure that they had all that they needed, and I had expectations in that vineyard. I expected some grapes. Now, I, I've got to tell you, in my little garden, I have a grape arbor. It's approximately 16 feet by 8 feet, uh, and it's got a trellis uh, for grapevines, and I have planted some Concord grapes and some white grapes and, and, uh, and just little shoots that uh, you can buy in the grocery store, Lowe's, or wherever you might find plants. And I have uh, tried to make sure that I got the right kind of fertilizer for it. I've tried to make sure that I watch to be sure it doesn't get too dry in that, even though grapes like dry ground and well-drained ground. Uh, but now in about the seventh or eighth year of planting and replanting grapevines of different kinds and varieties, uh, I have yet to get the first grape. <laughs> Well, God had expectations for his vineyard, too. He had given it the best of everything, and his expectations were that he would have a good crop, but he got nothing but sour grapes. Uh, now, we're talking about the nation of Israel. He gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. And unlike me, uh, where I use probably the wrong kind of ground, because here we have a heavy amount of clay that's not real well drained and uh, the garden that I have is shaded too many hours of the day so that grapes need bright sunlight and uh, unlike me God gave Israel the best of everything and he had the reason for expectations my reasons for expectations probably were not well founded uh, but nevertheless he had expectations and his expectations, as we've already read in chapters 1 through 4, were for good grapes, uh, but he got nothing but sour grapes. As a matter of fact, uh, worse than sour grapes, I think at one time, uh, some kind of a wild grapevine had established itself in my garden, and it, they were called fox grapes. And it looked like we finally were going to get a crop of grapes, and uh, we picked one off, and I gave it to Lois because it was only one or two grapes on the on the bush, and she spit it out because it was so foul. Well, that's exactly the kind of picture that God's painting for us here. He's saying, I, I gave it everything, and I expected good grapes, and I got nothing but foul grapes. Uh, these these people filled with iniquity, filled with, with sin and, and terrible, terrible behavior. And so he comes to them uh, once again, and... Uh, he tells them about the judgment that's going to come because of their iniquity. And uh, if you look at chapter 5, you'll see uh, that there are six woes that are listed uh, to the nation of Israel and to the people that are there. And it tells them clearly that the people are going to go into exile, uh, that they're going to be taken. Now, remember, this is 100 years before it happens. And uh, there's going to be darkness and distress in the land. Uh, so we could actually break down chapter 5 into three sections. The parable about the vineyard and expecting good grapes and getting nothing but bad grapes. Uh, the charges, if you will, issued against the nation, why they're going to experience what they're going to experience. And then the tool of punishment is even detailed and the fact that they're going to be invaded by foreign nations. This isn't going to come by natural disasters of uh, drought and famine, but this is going to come as a result of the surrounding nations. And all of that is outlined here clearly in chapter 5 and is the backdrop for the heart of the lesson as we enter into the next lesson uh, that God has for us from the book of Isaiah as we explore the Bible. And, and again, I want to repeat what was said in chapter 1, verse 18. Come, let us reason together. God not only confronts, but God also sends those who are willing. And aren't you glad that he wants to wait until you're willing? He's going to send those who have gifts and talents to accomplish his purposes, but they've got to be willing to go in order for them to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So let's take a look at today's lesson on God sending Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord lifted on a throne. 
lofty, exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two wings he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. Wow, what a significant section of scripture. And I'll tell you extra meaning that came to me today as the phone rang as I entered this text into this video. Stay tuned to the end of the video. You'll want to hear the story. Well, in verse 1, we have a date given of the vision. It was the day that the king died. And it tells us that the Lord is seated. The reason the Lord is seated is he's got a finished work. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The Lord and Jesus can sit down because it's a finished work. Everything that could be done for us, for our salvation, our eternity, was already completed. The rest is up to us. So he's seated at his throne, high and lofty. Why high and lofty? Because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He rules over all. All things were created by him, and all things exist because of him. And then it says that he had a robe on. But listen, it says just the hem of his robe filled the temple. <laughs> the greatness of God, even the hem of his robe, fills the temple. A number of years ago, I worked for a company named ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph. It was in the semiconductor division in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, it was a time of very great competition between the big semiconductor companies, Texas Instrument, Fairchild, uh, AMD, and many other companies that were fighting to get their market share of semiconductors. At the same time, an awful lot of that work was going offshore. Competition from Japan and other places was increasing. And even though I worked there for 11 years, we got to a place where there were so many rumors of our closing the plant because of the competition and because of the difficulty in making a profit that we changed general managers. I believe it was 11 times in 11 years. Sometimes they didn't make it a whole year. Sometimes they made it a little bit more than a year. But I remember there was a joke going around ITT at the time that said, if my boss calls, get his name. That's how fast things were changing. And I remember all of the frustration and the panic that so many in the plant had every time a new rumor would pass about a new general manager, new bosses, new organizations, and people being replaced and things happening in the plant that would cause everyone to wonder if they were going to have a job the next week. But I remember I was a young Christian. And my faith was strong, and I believe God was on his throne and that he was in control and in charge of everything, and that all I could do was do the very best job that I could at the plant and trust God for the results in my continued employment. And for 11 years, he provided that employment. And in the 11th hour after the plant was designated to close, at the 11th hour, when my uh, severance pay and all of the other benefits that I had were getting ready to expire. I had two job offers better than the one I had at ITT. Now, I already felt the call of my life to go into the ministry, and I was already preparing with seminary. But what a reassurance that God's on his throne, and he's in control of all things, and he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Well, there he is sitting on his throne, and just the hem of his garment fills the temple. Verse 2 talks about the seraphim and the cherubim, and the angels and the living creatures. And what a sight that must have been. But listen, this is around 600 to 700 years before Christ. Another hundred years after Christ's birth, 
John, the apostle, is taken to heaven and he sees the throne of God. I want you to look at what he wrote that confirms to us with these events taking place more than 700 years apart, how clearly both Isaiah and John the Apostle see heaven and God in heaven. Take a look with me at Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Revelation 4, verses 1 through 11. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he was sitting was like jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in the appearance. Around the throne there were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments, golden crowns on their heads. Out of the throne came flashing of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, in the center and around the throne four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creatures were like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature like the face of that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes and around and within, and day and night they do not cease in saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was who is and is to come. Then the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things because of you, your will, they exist and were created. Now, does that sound familiar to the book of Revelation? Holy, holy, holy. What an incredible song. I wish I could play it for you now by someone that's recorded it, but I'd be violating copyright laws. So the best I can do is to read it to you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who wert and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power and love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, 
blessed trinity. In verse 4 it says, And the foundations of the thresholds tremble at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. <sighs> wow. Can you imagine when we see him face to face? Holy, holy, holy. Let's take a look at the next section of scripture. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. The first step for forgiveness is confession. And as you can see, as we started out in that section of scripture, Isaiah knew that when you stand before a holy God, you have to confess your sins. You have to confess your iniquity. Whether you're doing it for salvation or whether you're doing it to get back in good standing with him, confession is the very first part. And we see very clearly that God is always ready to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when that angel came with a burning coal and touched his lips, he found that cleansing, the cleansing that only God can give. Now let's look at verses 8 through 10. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. God has given all Christians a gift, or at least one gift, maybe multiple gifts. Gifts to fit into the body of Christ, gifts to be used in service, gifts to build up the church. And he says, who can I send? <laughs> Will you say, send me? Well, you see, I can remember back to my calling to be a pastor. I can remember back to where I was raised and how I felt. And, and I remember when God placed the call on my life and I finished my seminary training, uh, that I said, God, send me any place except back to West Palm Beach, Florida. Now, why did I say that? Most of you uh, love going to the beach. Well, that's because you live near the mountains. And everybody that lives in the beach want to go to the mountains. So we always want what we don't have. But I had been in West Palm Beach for 29 years. I had been through all of the heat. And anybody that knows me knows I hate the heat. It doesn't take anything much over 70 before I'm sweating and the water just running off me. And... West Palm Beach is beautiful, but it's flat and doesn't have big trees. It doesn't have beautiful rolling hills or mountains. And I was ready for a change and didn't really want to go back to hurricanes, roaches, and all of the heat of Florida. And I said, Lord, send me any place but West Palm Beach. And guess where he sent me? Guess where my first church was? Yes, you know. It was West Palm Beach. And even my next 27 years in the ministry were not in a place in the mountains. And the next five years were not a place in the mountains. And so you can see 32 years in Florida when that was the last place that I wanted to be. But you've got to be willing to do what God wants you to do. Now, I still say, God, you can send me any place you want to send me. But don't send me to a mud hut in Africa. And I'm afraid to ask that prayer, but thankfully, I guess I'm so old now that it's too late for a mud hut in Africa. But I'll admit this. 
the five years at First Baptist Church of Dover, the 27 years at Southside Baptist Church were some of the happiest years of my life. And I know that God was able to use me there because that's where he wanted to send me. That's where he had my ministry. And I can imagine that Isaiah, who had even a much, much worse calling than I had, because not only did he send him to a rebellious and a sinful people, but he told him ahead of time, they're not going to listen. They're not going to see. They're not going to hear. Their hearts aren't going to be changed. But you got to do this. So I'm sending you. Now let's look at the next section of scripture. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth and an oak, and whose stump remains when it is felled, and the holy seed is its stump. You can't blame Isaiah for wondering how long this task was going to be. How long was he going to have to put up with people that wouldn't listen, wouldn't see, wouldn't understand, wouldn't care? And God says, it's going to have to continue until there is no more. Just a tenth will be left. But there's that little bit of hope, that little bit of hope that we all have, that remnant that's left. Uh, there's going to be a chance for them to reestablish this nation, this great nation of Israel. But that, as for Isaiah, he had a task that was difficult probably far more difficult than anything God's going to ask me or you to do. So let's go back to chapter 1. Come, let's reason together. What's the reason you can't serve him? What's the reason you can't go where he wants you to go, do what you want, what he wants you to do? Who's your one? I realize that witnessing has become twice as difficult now that we have social distancing and masks. We're not meeting together in corporate worship. We can't have friends over to have a lunch or a barbecue. But we can still witness. You see, today with all of our electronic devices, people are just a couple of finger pushes away. We can tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. We can tell them that there is hope in this lost and dying world. And we better do it pretty soon because I believe we're living in the end times. I believe that we better listen to what Isaiah said. Here am I. Send me. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. I hope you stay tuned for your church's services. I hope that you're going to be able to go in person. But if not, I hope that you're going to be faithful to watch it on your videos, devices, and that you're going to be able to worship. And don't be afraid to sing along. It's a good thing to give praise and thanks to God. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, I promised you one more thing, didn't I? You see, when I was entering in those words of seeing God on his high exalted place, and I entered in not only what Isaiah saw, but I also entered in what John saw, the apostle in heaven, I received a phone call from a very dear friend in Florida to let me know that one of my closest friends living in Florida was very near death. That the doctors had told her that there was no more that they could do and that his heart was failing quickly and that all of the surgeries and everything else that had been done was just too much for his body and that her children should be called so that they could say their goodbyes. My good friend Jeff Spell is totally in God's hands. As of right this moment, he hasn't gone to heaven. 
but based on all of the doctor's reports and that phone call, soon, just as Isaiah saw and just as John the Apostle saw, he will see God. He will see him on his throne, high and lifted up. And just the train of his temple, of his robe will fill the temple. And he'll be able to say, along with all of the others that are there, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God bless you and have a great day.